Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Fax Centre in Liverpool. My name is Jan I'm a member of Tennisman. It's Tennisman not uh, producing the show in alliance with Fact. Uh, we're here to discuss a very, very topical issue, a very serious issue of attaining to Liverpool life. We have a very knowledgeable panel in front of us. I'm only here to introduce the show. We'll be in very capable hands of Mr. Liam Foggs here, name I suppose. I think everybody will know of it regarding the mayoral issue. And with that, Ian, Ian I'd like to hand it over to you. Thank you very much, John. And thank you for the free plug for our campaign. I'm, I'm here in a private capacity today. Um, gun crime is one of those uh, topics which has been dominating the headlines in Liverpool, certainly over the last 12 months or so. Uh, the death of Rhys Jones in Croxford Park, obviously, drew national attention, if not international attention. Um, but this is an opportunity, really, to reflect on how widespread uh, gun crime in Liverpool is, how significant it is as defining entire areas of our city. Um, looking at the role of uh, the press and, and the print media in um, addressing issues of, of criminality and antisocial behaviour, talking to people who deal with it on a daily basis, either as victims, neighbours, community leaders, um, or from the, the police service uh, to get their perspective on, on gun crime in Liverpool. Does Liverpool have a unique problem? Is this something that most major British, if not European cities, have to deal with? I was listening to um, RTE Irish Radio last week, and there apparently is a spate of gun crime in Limerick, with gang leaders and their families being uh, shot at and assassinated on almost a weekly basis. And that's a city with 80,000 inhabitants. Um, so perhaps Liverpool is not as, as uh, forlorn and troubled as maybe we might think. Nonetheless, there are real problems and real fears and real concerns out there. Um, I want to start by going round some of the people who've come to join us today. And if I may, Stephen, Stephen Moore from Merseyside Police is a detective superintendent with the Matrix team. Um, now, a microphone will wind its way to you. You have it. Uh, you're hiding it. You're working undercover today, clearly. In plain clothes. Uh, Stephen, just explain first of all what Matrix is about. The, um, the Matrix team is Merseyside Police's response to, to gangs and gun crime. Um, as Liam said, I am the head of the Matrix team and have been since January and I feel very proud to hold that position. Uh, Matrix consists of a number of elements. We have a, a covert wing, and as that name implies, they are you know, police officers who work in plain clothes. Um, they're very skilled in covert surveillance techniques and they look to target people who are using guns. We have a, a reactive element and they are experienced detectives who every time a gun is fired on Merseyside, they pick up that investigation. As I said, they're highly trained, they use cutting edge techniques and it's their job to bring those, to identify the offenders and to bring them to justice. We also have a uniformed disruption wing the uniformed officers, you've probably seen the, the yellow matrix vans, and they go out and they target people that we know are involved in gun and gang crime. And a recent addition to matrix since January has been a, a coordination wing, and that exists now to bring other agencies into the war against gun crime, because we realize that the police will not solve the problem of gun crime uh, in the long term. We our job is to enforce the law and to protect people, and we do that, and I think we do that very well. But if we're going to solve this problem, we've got to be thinking 10 years ahead to stop the five-year-olds of today becoming the gunmen, and it usually is, unfortunately, the gunmen, uh, in 10 years' time when they're 15. We can't do that on our own, and that's why we need help from local authorities, through education providers, through housing providers, and lots of other agencies that can bring things to bear when we identify. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those mm -hmm. partnerships uh, shortly, but let's talk about results. Uh, can you tell us, in statistical terms, how effective the Matrix program has been in putting people away and in taking weapons and ammunition out of circulation? Well, if I tell you, in, in the last just over 12 months, Merseyside Police have taken just over 300 what I would call lethal battled weapons off the streets. There are lots of definitions that are bandied about by the Home Office and by other agencies, but what really concerns me is a weapon that is capable of firing a bullet and taking a life. And we've taken 
over just over 300 such weapons off the streets in the last 12 months. Since the 1st of April, we have put people away for terms of imprisonment that's over 54 years. So that's just within the last five weeks of this financial year. And in terms of what uh, Merseyside Police is doing, is this sort of intense targeted approach, is it unique? And is it a response to a unique uh, Merseyside problem? Uh, the problem is not unique to Merseyside, and, and I know we'll move on to how the media portray Merseyside, and, and I think there's lots of work for us to do there. But if you consider, if there was, it's a horrible term, but if there was a, a league table, if you like, of gun crime, Merseyside would be a poor fourth in the country. The Metropolitan Police has a, a bigger problem. Greater Manchester Police has a bigger problem. The West Midlands, and then there's Merseyside. And I think something that would amaze lots of people, if I threw the challenge out, what is the fifth police force in that uh, unenviable league table? What would it be? And most people say, oh, it would be Nottingham or, or somewhere like that, or maybe Strathclyde in Scotland. Actually, the fifth is Lancashire. But very, very rarely do we see the banner headline, welcome to the gun crime capital of the world. Yeah. Lancashire doesn't happen. Yeah. Thanks for that, Stephen. We'll, we'll come on to some of those other points that you've raised um, as the conversation continues. Um, turning to Ian MacDonald, who is from City Safe, which is one of these partnership organisations that no one's quite sure uh, what they actually do. Explain what City Safe is, Ian. Um, well, I, I'm actually a, a previous employee of City Safe. I haven't worked there for a couple of years now. But they exist to pull together agencies to deal with crime and disorder and health issues. Uh, it's a very wide ranging brief. Uh, the emphasis for them, I think, is on prevention and, and on being creative. And uh, they're pretty well acclaimed within England as one of the better uh, crime and disorder reduction partnerships. Um, in terms of, of, of Liverpool, isn't one of the problems that these characters who have weapons and use them and flaunt them um, kind of set the tone for life in certain parts of the city. We all know what parts we're referring to. That they may be small in number, but they have a huge influence on their, their neighbours and their communities and a huge influence on the image of the city. I, I agree with that. I think um, the thing about gun crime can be a bit misleading and take us away from some deeper issues. Uh, you get gun crime where you've got gangs and you get gangs around the world where the established authority doesn't have enough credibility. And so gangs and powerful people of a criminal ideology uh, can have influence in communities where we're not doing well enough. And that's why you get guns. So, so you're saying that the guns kind of fill a vacuum, a leadership va vacuum or a community leadership vacuum, that those with guns are those with authority? Um, Criminals with guns will have more authority than criminals without, and they will deal in violence to establish themselves and keep themselves in place. Um, and the currency that they will use in this city is drugs. Um, I want to turn, if I may, to, to Tracy, Tracy Dunn, who's joined us. Tracy is a filmmaker who's collaborating with an organisation called Heal8, uh, which is a uh, voluntary organisation based in Liverpool 8, uh, looking at improving that community through public health and through lifestyle and so on. And Tracy, you're midway through uh, making a film or writing a screenplay about gun violence, which I believe is based on, on personal experience. As well, much as anything. I've actually been shot at three times. <laughs> so uh, it's probably no surprise that is I that why you're Is that why you're sitting on your own, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't really want to make a film about guns, to be honest, but um, the idea, what happened, I was working as a camera operator recently for two days, shooting a film, and um, I kept thinking, this is, this is reminding me of a gun, you know, it was shiny black metal and, you know, it made clicking noises as you loaded it, um, you had to aim and then you had to shoot, so it was really, it was really in the front of my mind how similar a gun was to a movie camera, and I'd already started my course at Heal 8, and um, I've written a play with them already, so um, I always start by doing my research, hence all the, um, the newspaper clippings which are up there, and I've actually collected them from, just got back from London and Essex, so I've been collecting local newspaper clippings from there. Um, but my film is, well, my screenplay, it's a 10 minute short, which hopefully I will put into production and take it around local schools and colleges 
but it's going to be about a young boy who has a gun. He's not really a drug dealer or a gangster. He's got his gun for protection, and he would use it. If somebody threatened him, he'd definitely shoot them. Um, at the moment, I'm kind of just thinking up the plot, but I'm bringing in cameras as quick as possible, and my opening scene is actually what happened to me on the 82 bus on Park Road, where there was a noise in the bus, and it was... It was just a really strange noise, very loud, and we realised it was a, a ball bearing gun, and it come through the window, and it was ricocheting around the back of the bus, and that was quite terrifying. And the worst thing of all is that the the boy with we saw a boy on the other side of the road pointing a gun, and he was about nine years old. Um, so what's happening is in my film there'll be I'm going to bring in CCTV footage from the bus. Then there'll be mobile phone footage. Um, and then in games like Grand Theft Auto, apparently, I haven't seen it yet, but you can, the gunman can create his own photo album as he goes round um, on the rampage. Um, so uh, what I want to do is to change this boy's life by showing him that he realizes a gun is purely for destruction, but a movie camera is for creation. And it, in the long run, it's going to bring him and everybody around him a lot more contentment. And, you know, it won't cause so much harm. Um, so at the moment, I'm just kind of researching and thinking about how I'm going to change this boy's headspace from having a gun to having a movie camera. And the idea is that it will influence young children. They'll, real, they'll prefer to have a movie camera rather than a gun. <laughs> yeah. um. This has, it's fascinating that you use, as it were, the arts and, and the visual arts to try to address this social problem. And I know that Carol from Croxton is working on not dissimilar lines. I just wonder, though, whether there's a risk that you uh, would acknowledge of glamorizing it all. That, that even in attempting to address it and to challenge these, these attitudes, you sort of... Well, that, that's raise like its status and make it more glamorous and more alluring than it ought to be. Well, I actually didn't want to make a, write a screenplay about guns exactly for those reasons, you know. But the idea just didn't go out of my head. So um, I just think when something is in the front of your mind, I think, you know, that's what you should really be focusing on. So that's why I've gone ahead. But believe me, you know, if I could make a film about something a bit more, um, <laughs> something different, I would. But as I say, this idea hasn't gone away. And I do feel very concerned myself about um, what is happening in the world and um, so I, I just think um, I don't have any answers but as I read something recently and it, I'm just planting some seeds so hopefully people can think about what's going on and maybe if we face up to reality then perhaps we, we can um, make some better make some changes Well I know we're going to explore you know, possible solutions to this and ways of moving beyond uh, gun crime and beyond gun culture. Um, I'll bring Andy Edwards from the Echo in in a minute, but before I do, it's a good an as good an opportunity as any to view uh, the film, uh, which um, the Liverpool Echo, uh, I see Liverpool website show shortly after the death of Rhys Jones, uh, which is uh, widely disseminated, or was at the time, on YouTube. I don't know whether it's still up or whether it's been taken down. Um, if we're talking about glamorising gun crime, this is how the young people choose to do it. Spinning stolen cars through city streets and far worse in a series of shocking videos being circulated on high-tech mobile phones. The violent world of Liverpool's young gangs has been captured on mobile phone footage and sent to children as young as 11 as the teen thugs try to enhance their reputations and recruit potential members. The Echo has passed four pieces of footage we obtained to Merseyside Police, which has now launched an investigation into the videos. Police Chief Superintendent Andy Ward and his team is ready to rise to the challenge of stopping the teen terrors. He spoke to me today. Chief Superintendent, uh, you've just seen mobile phone footage that the Echo has received in the last few days of uh, antisocial criminal behaviour around the city. What's your response to it? Yes, very, very disappointed. Very disappointed that uh, young people today um, get some sort of pleasure in um, filming what is 
well, a range of uh, offences, both from using firearms right the way through to stolen vehicles, uh, the use of dangerous dogs, right through to general antisocial behaviour, uh, that they get some pleasure from this and then forward it to other people. Um, I can only assume the reason for this is that they want to encourage other people in this sort of behaviour. Uh, and clearly, from my point of view, I want to discourage that as, as best as I possibly can. What would you say to parents whose, uh, whose youngsters may have this material on their phones? I think this is the biggest message I've got of all. First of all, to discourage uh, people from doing this. But secondly, I would say to parents, are you aware of where your children are and what they're actually doing? This is, you know, between the 14, 19 age group. Um, if you get an opportunity, have a look at your son's or daughter's phones and see what's on it. Uh, because, I mean, the thing is, you know, some of these uh, children may just be on the periphery and considering uh, getting involved in some of this activity because it's glamorised. Uh, the last thing I want to do is end up... Uh, having to go around to uh, one of the houses tonight and say, look, could you possibly come with us because uh, I'm afraid your son or daughter is lying in the mortuary. And that's the reality of what we're dealing with here. The clips show different gang members from Norris Green, Croxteth, Daysbrook and Lark Hill. It, it's very difficult to actually stop the material being put out. We are monitoring what's actually happening, but, but it's very easy for us to, to, to start tracking about who's actually doing it. So if people think that they actually are putting it onto mobile phones or video cameras and then deleting it, uh, and, that, and it's not then traceable, that's absolutely incorrect. Uh, our high-tech crime unit will take these phones and even if it's been deleted, we can clearly identify where recordings have been made on what phones. So if people are mixed up in this antisocial behaviour and they're out on the streets, don't be surprised if you're looking at your phones uh, and we take them off you. All of the video clips, which are up to three minutes in length, have been edited and include backing tracks from popular rap songs. One of the clips even shows graffiti tributes to 19-year-old gang member Liam Smigger-Smith, who was shot in the head outside Old Coast Prison last month. His death was the first fatality in the long-running feud between the Strand Gang and the Croxteth crew. You can help in the fight against the Yobs in a number of ways. Anyone with information about guns is asked to contact Merseyside Police Gun Crime Hotline on 0800 458 1211. Anyone with any information about gangs can also contact the Echo's confidential Reclaim Our Neighbourhoods line on 0151 330 or send us an email in confidence to reclaim at liverpoolecho.co.uk. Andy Edwards uh, from Liverpool Echo uh, is with us. Andy, talk us through the sort of editorial discussions you would have had before you and your colleagues decided to put that material up on your own website. The first thing that you have to consider is uh, whether or not um, publishing it, whether it's in print or whether it's online, is going to have a, an adverse uh, effect, uh, whether it's going to uh, cause more problems uh, than it solves. Um, and so what we did was to, uh, to communicate with Andy Ward, who you saw there, um, explain uh, that this material had come to us uh, and make an arrangement with Merseyside Police to, uh, to publish it in, the, in a way that uh, A, would serve uh, as, uh, as a warning, uh, B, would present things as they are, uh, and C, could just result uh, in parents who we know uh, have been failing to uh, come forward and uh, uh, with information on, on uh, gun crime uh, to do so because they would be so shocked by what they saw there. Um, I know that um, the Echo has been uh, under the spotlight itself for the way it covers certain elements of, of these uh, gun incidents. I mean, let's talk about the Liam Smith uh, shooting and the subsequent uh, palaver in, in Norris Green on the day of the funeral and so on. Um, you take an extremely non-judgmental line, don't you? Um, and I just wondered whether your readers were happy with that, or whether there was an appetite either among them or in your newsroom for a more sort of aggressive, let's call a spade a spade sort of attitude. It's very difficult uh, to um, be a judgmental uh, as a newspaper on, uh, on an issue like this. Um, in those circumstances, uh, what we were dealing with was uh, a, a murder, um, even if the victim was somebody who was involved in crime. Uh, we were dealing with a victim uh, who had a family. We were dealing with a victim whose mother we'd been speaking to on a regular basis. 
Uh, so uh, in terms of dealing with that particular incident, we played it straight down the line. Uh, but in terms of gun crime uh, in the city, uh, we are judgmental uh, and we do make a very, very bold statement in a number of ways, um, including our Liverpool Unites campaign, which I know we're going to be talking about during the course of, uh, of our discussions today. But we want to reflect the views of the people of Merseyside and those views currently in the wake of Rhys Jones's murder are that they've had enough of gun crime. Uh, I mean, for instance, there was coverage of a case last week and I was quite surprised that you referred to the two protagonists as members of a gangster family. Two well-known gangsters, you know who they are, were put away. And I thought, crikey, that's, I, I've not seen that before. A, a sense that you were sharing the sort of contempt for these people that your readers would. Has there been a shift at all? There has been a shift, and I think it's quite an interesting point. I also thought it was an interesting point that Steve made uh, uh, in relation to, to Matrix uh, earlier, and that is that um, you can deal with things the way we have been for a long, long time, or you can suddenly become a lot more aggressive. Uh, there can be an attitude that says, we're going to sort this out. Uh, and in the case of naming gangsters, yes, we will do that. Um, if we're confident uh, that we have enough information about their uh, past uh, to describe them as such, we will. Because we're quite aware that readers aren't daft, and that when we don't refer to them as gangsters, <laughs> Uh, people ring in and say, do you know who this person is? Do you know what this person's done? Do you know their background? Are so you people do know. Are you familiar with the work of Paul Williams, who is the crime correspondent for the Sunday World, which in, in Dublin, um, in Dublin, as you know, has got a huge and ongoing problem with criminality and gangsterism and drugs. The language he uses, you know, it wouldn't be used in polite company. He'll talk about tow rags, you know, gorriers, hooligans, scumbags. <laughs> In the, you know, the top line of a story. He's really in there. Not, not, not the echo way, I think. No, no, absolutely right. He does. Um, but to a degree, we are operating in that way. Um, we, we no longer... It's interesting. Uh, there are going to be occasions when you have to be very careful as far as the law is concerned. Uh, but the way that courts treat newspapers in terms of uh, contempt uh, these days has shifted as well as the way we treat stories has changed. Uh, and it, um, as long as um, we're on reasonably safe ground, we feel comfortable enough to be able to be courageous. And I think newspapers, I think media in general, needs to be courageous. Um, and, uh, uh, and rather in the way that uh, Matrix approached the uh, problem of gun crime uh, and uh, become disruptive, make the lives very, very awkward for the people who are involved in crime, make them feel uncomfortable, make them feel they're going to be watched every step of the way. We play a part in that, then I'm going to feel pretty cool about it. Yeah, um, Steve. Um, obviously, your officers, uh, you're dealing directly with incidents of gun crime and dealing with these people on a daily basis. Uh, do you keep half an eye on the press coverage to see whether it uh, helps your effort or perhaps occasionally hinders your effort? Um, if I could just refer back to something that was said earlier by our friend when she said you've been shot at three times, I wouldn't want anybody thinking I'm just sitting here and going to let that go and we'll obviously have a conversation afterwards about those three incidents, if we may. Um, your question about do we keep an eye to the press, yes we do, and I've got to say that we have found the local press to be very, very supportive and I'd like to think that we work very closely with our friends from the Liverpool Echo. And I think what Andy was referring to there about Matrix and the way we, we seek to disrupt these people, um, we have implemented an approach that was first piloted in Boston in the mid-1990s. Boston had a terrible problem with uh, gun crime, and, and in particular young people using guns. And they identified what they called impact players, these key players that they felt, if they were disrupted, if they could some way be neutralized, it would make a big difference to gun crime. And what we've done, we have identified these key players across Liverpool and the wider Merseyside area. And we have warned them. We have gone to them, we have served them with notices, we have video recorded the service of those notices. And I'm paraphrasing, but what we've said is, we know that you are involved in gun crime. This is your one opportunity to stop. If you do not stop, we will use every power available to us to disrupt you. The truth of the matter is, if somebody, somebody doesn't wake up one morning and think, I'm going to be a gun criminal now, there's a, there's a lead up to it. And such people, if you're willing to take a life, 
you're not going to obey any of the other rules in civilized society. So you park your car on double yellow lines or on zebra crossings, you park in disabled bays, you drop litter, you cause antisocial behavior, you'll steal from shops, you won't insure your car, you won't tax your car because basically you think you are above society. What we've said to these people is, you are not. And there's a time-honored tradition in, in British policing that we have an element of discretion. A police officer, if, if they deem fit, can give words of advice for minor offending. And people usually appreciate that. Thank you, officer. I won't park there again. I'm on my way. What we've said to these impact players, these gun criminals, is discretion doesn't apply to you. So, I mean, we saw on that, that, that video clip uh, there were dangerous dogs probably going around unrestrained. There were high-powered scooters and motorcycles. It's, you know, the gun, the gun crime is the most extreme example of, of an attitude, of a sort of approach to life, which is clearly making lots of people very unhappy and very miserable. Would you and your people seize those dogs, take those bikes off the road, and generally just get on their case 24-7? Or, 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 or is, that, is that allowed? <laughs> Yes, it is allowed because the, the, there's legislation to stop people having dangerous dogs. There's legislation to stop people using vehicles and antisocial, uh, as part of antisocial behaviour. There are lots and lots of laws that, as I said before, quite often a police officer can give some words of advice. But we have told these people, if you do not walk away from the gun, we will do everything we can to, in effect, make your life a misery and to put controls around you because... It might seem petty if somebody's prepared to use a gun to arrest them for shoplifting, but when they go to court, we seek either a remand in custody, or if we can't get that, we get strong bail conditions, things like curfews. So you must be at this address between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. Now, if they are these gun crime nominals, as we call them, these key impact players, if they are on a curfew 7 to 7, you can bet your life after 7 o'clock every evening, a police officer will be knocking on the door asking them to present themselves. If they're not there, they've breached their bail conditions, they're arrested and they go back before the court. And then we say, now please keep them in custody because they cannot obey the rules. Do you regard it as a sign of success that anti-matrix graffiti uh, is to be found in various parts of the city? I think it's... Uh, no, I, that's not a trick question. No, I, I, it must genuinely I, give you some satisfaction. No, I, I, don't, I don't take it as a trick question. What would give me greater satisfaction is seeing the number of firearm discharges reduce and as we sit here today, I'm pleased to say that since the 1st of April, we've had three firearm discharges. I think that's probably unheard of in, in recent memory on Merseyside. But even then, I wouldn't want to, to worry people because if you, if you consider somewhere like Philadelphia in the United States, similar sized population to Merseyside, they have more firearms discharged in a month than we have in a year. I know there's greater accessibility to firearms, but that just puts it into some kind of context. I will move the discussion on in, in a moment. Just, just one question, though, really, Stephen, is the, would you say that there's a sort of uh, a division between your old-style criminal families who are prepared to use guns to achieve other objectives, you know, robberies, extortions, whatever, and basically these scallywags who have come into possession of weapons? And does your attitude, to the, uh, do you tailor your responses and your, your, your initiatives accordingly? Yes, we do, because people talk very glibly about gun crime, but there are di many different facets to gun crime. And uh, I think what you're alluding to there, Liam, is the, the more mature, organized criminal. And they will use guns usually to protect the criminal market or their share of the criminal market, usually drugs, or to expand that market against opposing factions. But yes, there, unfortunately, there are also young people who will use firearms sometimes in response to what they see as disrespect from another group. And some of these sort of feuding factions, as it were, I if you took some of these young people to one side and said, what started all this? I don't think they could tell you. It's just slipped from their memory. Yeah. Um, Ian from, from CitySafe, or one of the initiators of CitySafe, um, let's focus on, on young people. Let's focus on the most impressionable members uh, of our community. Uh, what uh, have CitySafe been responsible for in terms of addressing young people's attitudes to crime and, and antisocial behaviour and by extension to gun crime? I think the line that the City Safe have taken in, in collaboration with the police <coughs> has been about taking a very firm line against gang leaders and guys who are clearly committed to that criminal path. Um, and the use of antisocial behaviour or others has great potential in that and, and has become something of a bureaucratic nightmare to try and get them home. 
uh, but their potential is significant because when you start controlling and limiting the behavior of these characters, they're not such good role models. Uh, the other thing City Safe have done is work very hard for diversion and education and support for kids who are on the fringe of criminal behavior. Um, and some of, the some of the stuff we've done with them has been about getting involved in the creative arts, making films, doing that type of thing, uh, to try and pull them away from uh, you know, the other route. And then at a more general level, there's all the stuff about positive media coverage that does have an impact. People don't drink and drive now, as they did in the 70s. And that's been done largely through consistent, high level, skillful media about the consequences of those actions. So I think there's a number of layers at which City Safe have worked, and I think it's had an effect. I think the Reese Jones thing um, has brought a lot of adverse publicity to the city, and it was a bad situation, and the aftermath of it was bad news. But as has been said by the police, you know, Liverpool's not the worst place in this country for gun crime. I want to um, take this opportunity to have a look at a film that City Safe uh, has uh, collaborated with Sam Support After Murder and Manslaughter in making, which is, is targeted at young people, a way of reminding them that there are alternatives uh, to a life of crime or a life of gun crime. So we'll perhaps just have a look at it at a minute or so. I just don't need the houses. Best Doesn't matter though, we will, we'll get in. Well, watch. Hey, Sam, you're not going to be the best man. No way, we're getting in here. I've told you, we'll, we'll get, get in. in. We'll we will, I told you, I've got this, of course we'll get in. Who's <laughs> 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 that? Who's that? Who's that? Better not be me, mum and dad. I'll see who it is, lads. If it's me, mum, she's not coming in. Just shut the door. Come on, you're saying you're nice. What's going on? 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 stuff. Um, I think it's a reminder of just how, um, how how much a part of ordinary life uh, guns have become in some parts of parts of the city and amongst some uh, age groups. Um, Andy, you spoke about the Liverpool Unites campaign. Um, I must admit, um, I know the Echo is a campaigning paper, and it does pick causes, whether it's to stop the rot of, of, of derelict buildings or whether it's to erect a statue to the two bishops or whatever. Um, did you have any um, second thoughts about perhaps riding on the back of a deeply personal, deeply tragic event? Or were you able to convince yourself that Liverpool Unites could make a proper difference, a real difference? I think that uh, the most important thing in terms of the launch of Liverpool Unites was that, funnily enough, that the, the uh, decision to launch the campaign probably wasn't ours. It was more to do with the people of Merseyside. Um, I think most people in this room will remember the moment when um, Rhys Jones's parents went to, uh, to Anfield as uh, staunch Evertonians, and they went onto the pitch with their older son. 
uh, and the reception that they got from the two sets of supporters was quite incredible, quite moving. And we felt that it really did sum up the mood of, uh, of Merseyside. And so we didn't launch Liverpool Unites immediately after uh, Reese's death. We launched it um, uh, at least two weeks afterwards. Um, and it, was, it had given us enough time to assess the mood of the city and assess the fact or come to the conclusion um, that we needed to do more than just uh, record uh, the fact in shocking detail about what had happened and run the interviews and run the appeals and say how terrible it all was. We needed to capture the mood of the city at the time uh, and make it uh, positive and make it something that we could work on for years to come and we'll continue to work for years to come. The, the campaign itself uh, has four stated aims, which is fine, but it's also got a charity arm to it, which is raising uh, half a million pounds towards a community centre in Reese's name in Croxteth. Um, and it uh, is also uh, ribbon-led, so it's got the purple ribbon, which is the combined colours of the two football clubs as a result of that moment at, uh, at Anfield. Um, and the wearing of the ribbon, which we can see all over the city, is seen as a statement from people that, uh, that the murder of Reese really was a pivotal moment. It is a crossroads, and it's a time for us to be able to, to react and do something about it. Um, I noticed the adverts were in the paper last week for full-time employees to manage the, the charitable trust, which mm. is, which is um, a product of Liverpool United. So just give us an idea of what sort of things they'll be spending that money on. I mean, assuming that you raise the half million you need for the, for the, for the Young People's Centre, what, what sort of projects, what sort of target groups would you mm. think would benefit from the money you raise and the campaign you would take forward? The, the, um, the target of, of uh, 500,000 will be uh, met, we think, in August. Uh, and after that, uh, Liverpool Unites uh, will be uh, making uh, grants to community organisations uh, that provide activity for, uh, for people um, who, I'm just trying to think of the right words for this now, uh, people who put something into their community can expect to get something out of Liverpool Unites. People who give an alternative, uh, people who put their time into, uh, into, into uh, the right sort of activities will be rewarded, and that's what we hope to be able to do. Now, I'm conscious that up to now we've had um, people in authority, people with various roles in, in public bodies speaking, and uh, Tracy as well with her um, sc screenwriting and, and filmmaking. Are there any members here of the audience who have um, a particularly keen interest? I'm just thinking, Carolyn, we spoke before the session began. Uh, you are from Croxteth and are involved in a project to support uh, a film. Is that right? Are oh, you not? No, I'm not from Croxton. Uh, uh, just, just give us some background as to what your, your direct interest is in this whole response to gun crime. Well, I've just currently um, done a play and a film about gun crime, particularly in Croxton. Um, not so much of East Jones or the Smig, but elements of it. Um, as a writer um, and as a mother, uh, you know, I'm really concerned about what's going on. Also, um, it's quite hard for this group, you know, and half made them in. But I've got a son who's actually doing prison for murder. So I'm from the other side of the fence. Um, the play I wanted to do was about... I believe if you ask me how we fix gun crime, I think we need to break down the wall of silence within communities where people don't fear to say, you know, what's going on and things like that. And I think it's only the community... Can you can do that, the police can't do that, no one can do it. All the communities need to come together to see what's happening to our kids, because you know, our kids are getting killed and are killing, and we all have to realise that. Do, do you feel that um, communities where this is a big issue <coughs> uh, need more support from other more prosperous or peaceful parts of the city? Because one thing that struck me was during the whole wall of silence thing, uh, after the Reese Jones shooting, and bear in mind here that there are you know, proceedings underway, so we have to be careful what we say. But I was, I was surprised at how a relatively small group of people, many of them no more than children, should hold an entire community in thrall. How does that happen? That happens quite easily because it only takes someone to know someone's got a gun and you will get shot if you say anything. That's all it takes. So even the that, that, 10, that 15, can spread. people out there and yet the... Yeah. I think the discussion today, you know, we're not really going to get time to, to go into the depth of what is going on. You know, as a mother of um, someone who's currently, you know, in prison, 
I believe it's, we need to get to the parents, we need to get to the young parents. I think someone mentioned it. Um, I want to take the play and the film that I'm doing to the five-year-old, the, the parents of five-year-old kids. You start that young. Uh, yeah, I think that's where, where you begin. Um, the story that I'm doing is of a mother whose son has shopped somebody, she knows he's done it, and does she give him up? Um, from that angle. So it's probably going to be, you know, from the Reese Jones things, the mother of that, that boy, you know, why, how, how we, we do give our kids up. What about the alternatives to, as it were, that lifestyle choice that these young people uh, make? What are there alternatives out there, or is it up to uh, the likes of I think so much Unites or, or other organisations? So to much work needs to be done for the young kids, the young people of today. Um, that are still, it, I, if I look back to ten years ago, you know, we're all sitting here thinking this has just come, come along. It hasn't. It's been happening to families, to communities. And it's been getting long ignored, and it's only now just all coming to. So it's just this big explosion. It's not an explosion. It's been going on for a long time, and it's only through communities that are now getting fed up with it. People who are living in them communities. I've got, I'm from Kirby, and it's been. We're watching our children. We say to if we say to our kids, no, go on, you know, uh, crime is not the right way to live. Well, when they look at the next door neighbour who's got cars, big houses, going off on holidays, and they've never worked a day in their life, they say it does. And that's what people, the decent people of the communities were up against. It is now, you know, there is a change. I do believe there is a big change. But that was part and parcel. I think it was neglect 10 years ago where we, we're not looking at the, you know, the today we heard that pot is now going back up to a different category. You know, anyway, if you asked someone in the community 10 years ago, they could have told you, part is sending the kids loopy. And uh, Andy wanted to make a point there, I think, uh, once someone hands you a microphone. Yeah, it's this, 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 this notion that we have sort of turned a page or turned a corner and that there is a new uh, attitude out there towards gun crime. Is that something that, that you recognise? I think that was such a good point that you made there in relation to communities, and the answer does lie within the communities. The communities, the communities actually need help in doing that as well. Uh, and there's a programme at the moment uh, called Young Transformers. I don't know if uh, anyone knows about this in, uh, in this room, but uh, Young Transformers is uh, the product of the Merseyside Community Foundation. Um, and the uh, idea is that we get money in from sponsors, which could be business, and uh, any business that likes to support this idea would be great if they would. Uh, but uh, grants are made available, small grants are made available to people who actually give their time to providing an alternative for kids in areas. So it could be somebody who needs 300 quid for a football kit for the football team that they run. Um, there could be problem damaged roof in, in the local youth centre, it could be cricket, it could be anything, little swimming clubs. Um, there are lots of things going on in the communities and it's really, really important to recognise that the vast majority of people who live in troubled communities are great people and I've seen a lot of them and spoken to a lot of them, and they need support. Um, the, f the problems in the amongst the gangs in uh, Croxteth and Norris Green started in the playground as, as rows between rival gangs. The gang started at school, and then it developed outside of, outside of there, which is scary, and that's where so many people have made the point you need to get to them early. Um, there are some people who have reached a level now, I believe, where d the, the justice system is the only course of action for them, but there are people who are younger who we can still get to in time. Uh, and the point that was made there in relation to communities is so important. Parents have got a huge role to play in it. Uh, and projects like the Young Transformers are really important towards supporting people who really do put something into their communities. And there are loads of them out there. I was uh, invited to um, have a tour of St. Teresa's uh, Roman Catholic Primary School uh, in Norris Green a couple of months ago. Uh, a fantastic school and doing wonderful work and I was shown around by the head boy and the head girl who were both 11 and they were brilliant ambassadors I mean somebody should actually give them a job and pay them money because they were, they were superb but what was sad was that a lot of the staff said that the children many of the children regard the school as a refuge that the most positive experiences they have in their lives come in school and I thought that's sad and a little dangerous and a little scary if they weren't getting that sort of sustenance outside. Um, Ian, I know you, you, you're working with all sorts of partners, or have worked with all sorts of partners with, with City Safe. Um, who in Liverpool isn't pulling their weight? Name names. I'm a little bit out of touch, 
Um, what I would say is that um, in, in trying to do our work, we, we try to make communities better by looking at the environment. We try to work with vulnerable groups. Uh, we try to work through the judicial system. Um, I think there are problems in, in confronting poor behaviour because the problems with the ASBO system. Um, I think there's disproportionate amounts of, of health spending that don't really go straight to the problems. But uh, I think the big issue is, is what's been highlighted by the ECHO. It's of getting relatively small amounts of money to responsible people who are on the ground and giving them freedom to operate within the environments that they're in. That's the answer. And if there's anybody uh, not getting fully supported, it's the people on the ground level. And if the ECHO or anybody can cut through the bureaucracy and the levels of control and go to them and support them and give them their head, we'll create communities. And that's where the answer lies. I just want to develop this argument really with, with Stephen is that um, the matrix initiative program, whatever, um, that's sort of the, the, the great clunking fist, isn't it? Um, it's a very direct, aggressive, proactive way of dealing with criminal behaviour. How, if at all, does that link into these other issues of education, of offering alternatives to young people, of engaging with young people, it, it, from, from a Merseyside Police perspective? I recognise the comment that I think was attributed to Gordon Brown about the great clunking fist, but um, Matrix is much more than a great clunking fist. Let's Let's not let's not get this wrong, there has to be an element, if we're going to solve this problem, an element of stick and carrot. I think we are leading sort of the approach nationally in that we are not just using the stick, we are using the carrot. And I said that we'd added this extra dimension to Matrix, which is the Matrix Coordination Unit. We're actually, we've actually got now a high-level group that covers Merseyside, a multi-agency group, and there is representation from all the local authorities on Merseyside and the most senior judge on Merseyside and also representatives of the Crown Prosecution Service, <coughs> probation. And that is about, if enforcement is at the centre of the short-term approach to this problem, <coughs> there's got to be work around offering routes out of gang membership and out of criminality for young people. And we go back to this point, we've got to have a 10-year approach to pick up the five-year-olds now a real turning point for me personally was when somebody reported back to me an interview with a 14-year-old from the Croxteth area who said, what you've got to realise is, without crime, we're just poor. And what that 14-year-old meant was, and again I'm paraphrasing, it's all about self-esteem. Being just poor is weak, <coughs> accepting handouts. Being part of a gang, being involved in criminality gives them some self-esteem it makes them attractive within the, the groups that they mix in. It makes them attractive to, to young girls. It gives them some kind of authority. They can push to the front of queues, whether it be in McDonald's or whether it be in a nightclub when they get a bit older. And it all comes back to self-esteem. And if you've got somebody who has difficulty with reading, writing, the basic sort of maths, the jobs were once you could sell your muscle and your sweat to make a living have largely gone. And if you are excluded by society, because perhaps a school has excluded you or you've excluded yourself through truancy. With a backdrop of rampant materialism and everybody's got to have the latest mobile phone, the best trainers, a nice car, nice clothes, then it's no surprise that young people who have been excluded or excluded themselves will turn to crime. And that's what we've got to address in the long term. Yeah. Um, you, you, you raise uh, something that I wanted to explore. Given where we are, we're in fact, in fact, and um, this is uh, an institution that's de dedicated to, to images, uh, both movie images and video and audio and so on. And I'm very struck at the easy connections people make between things like violent films. Uh, you mentioned Grand Theft Auto, I think, Tracy, out this week to a, a storm of controversy. You're looking at the values that young people, I mean, very young people, kids, are absorbing. And I wonder whether anybody had specific concerns. Just, just a little... Uh, perspective from my point of view was literally, uh, I think the week after the Reese Jones killing, the bus shelters in that part of the world and across Liverpool were advertising an 18 certificate film called Smoking Aces. I don't know if anybody remembers it. It's a really rubbish film. Um, uh, Clive Owen was in it. 
And it was about guns and gunplay and gun wielding. And the images were images of grown-ups posing with guns in a macho way. And I thought, doesn't anybody get it? Does anybody share these concerns, or am I just getting old? Andy. Yeah, I'm sorry, hear my, hear my voice again. <laughs> the, um, it's quite an interesting point you make there, because the sad thing is, in truth, films like that shouldn't be a problem, should they? They should be fantasy, they should be escapism, uh, and people should all understand that uh, you don't really go around firing guns. But because we're in a society now where um, there are whole rafts of kids being brought up without having the right sort of values instilled in them by their parents, then they are a danger, uh, and we need to bear that in mind. In the past, people would just say, oh, that's, it's a film, that's all it is. You don't, you don't go out and behave that way. But I suspect, and I, maybe Steve would back me up on this, I suspect now that that sort of thing, combined with many others, results in 13 and 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, um, picking up, getting possession of firearms, not really quite understanding what they've got in their hand, not really understanding the power of the weapon that they've got, not understanding the consequences of pointing it at somebody and shooting. 75% of the time, and probably more, they actually miss because they're hopeless shots, these kids. But every now and again, you get a Reese Jones as a result of it. I, I do think we've got some opportunities to make better use of resources that are in communities. Um, it, it's a thing in England, it seems to me, that schools close at 5 o'clock and the kids can't get in. And, and the school fields are fenced off as best they can. I, I used to live in Jamaica. And um, the schools there were on two shifts. There were that many kids. But then when they finally cleared out at 8 o'clock, they were in use by the community until 11 and 12 at night. Uh, there's not much of that. And a lot of the facilities available to kids in this city don't match up to other places. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, though, let's talk about not so much the, the, the what's, on, what's available to young people and kids practically, but what's... What's the, um, what lessons are they absorbing from those around them? I mean, I know parents are a bit of an easy, uh, easy target in a way. I know that there's a lot of bad parenting or an absence of parenting altogether. And yet the purveyors of the movies and the video games and that whole bling culture, the lifestyle, surely they've got to take some responsibility. I don't know whether Steve has a, a view on that. I, I think I'd like to pick up on two points that Ian's made. Well, and, and, uh, the last point about schools and also earlier about targeted provision of services. And I think we should recognise here that Liverpool City Council, are, through City Safe, are doing some excellent work because to some extent, you can predict some of this behaviour when these, th these children are very young and there are certain risk indicators and, and certainly what City Safe are looking to do now is to identify at a very early stage children who are at risk and target their services on those individual young people and their families. Because one of the, unfortunately, one of the predictors of such behavior is um, single parent families, large families, generational unemployment. There are also some um, genetic factors that have been picked up as well. Some children who've got anti-social anti personality disorders and so on. But there's some ex excellent work that, it's in the early stages, but there's some excellent work that's been carried out by cities. Is that is that more than just snooping? Is that actually working with, say, social services? Uh, are there like oh, case studies exactly. of this going on? I, I referred earlier, as part of our enforcement approach, we've identified these key players. We're now looking to go beyond that and to look at the life history of those key players, looking for common themes that are emerging, which will then enable us, with the other agencies, to look at, well, this happened to this person and he ended up as a gun criminal at the age of 16, 17, whatever. So let's look at what happened in his early life when he was five, six or seven that might have led him down that path. And then we can identify other people within the community who may be at risk and put them onto a positive route rather than let them go down that route to picking up a gun. Yes, that's Carol, when you get the chance to put this play on in front of, of young audiences, what lessons do you want them to take away. Well, can I just pick up a oh point yeah. there, please? Because, oh yeah. you know, I, I strongly resent when people put fingers on uh, these kids of being from single parents or from, you know, broken homes or whatever. Um, I'm not a, a single parent. And I know what, you know, I've taught my 
kids' morals. What happens is it's the influences outside the family. It, of course, there's, there's certain elements, but you know, there's people like me who are becoming victims, and we're decent people. We've worked all our lives. We've done whatever with our children, but the influences outside are stronger, and you know, it's peer pressure, stuff like that. But it's certainly not. I don't. I don't believe it's everything. There, there are certain elements, but it's with a broken society. That's what my son was from a broken society, not a broken home. And as a society, we need to look at what is going on and why, 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 why are we broken? Because communities are broken up. Can I just, can I just yeah. come in? I, I didn't mean to insult anybody. I'm not saying that. Yeah, that I didn't take it as an insult. I just need to say that there are people like me, like myself, who are finding that you know, things are happening within their families and people cannot point fingers and say it's because of single parents. It's too easy. No, it's, and, and it, that's right, that is not a sole predictor. There's, it's a very complex problem. And there are any number of issues that can steer us in the right direction to identify people. And single parents, no, I wouldn't want anybody thinking if somebody's a single parent or somebody comes from a family where there's a single parent, that is a predictor alone, because it's not. So, a brief, brief final word for me, I think. Uh, on, on the... On, on the theme of good things to do and, and good opportunities, I do think there's some fantastic programs in parenting and anti-bullying. Um, you know, there's some great products, but the skill lies in getting them over to people in, in ways that are acceptable and, and positive and not seen as stigmatizing them. Um, but I think there are ways forward with that as well. And I know that there's stuff going on. It, it just comes down to long, hard work, long, hard, detailed work on the ground with loads of patience and compassion and empathy. Um, and and those, th those are things in short supply. Um, I would disagree with the, uh, the latter uh, comment about compassion and empathy being in short supply. I think there's an awful lot of that in Liverpool. Uh, but it's how you channel it and how you use it and how you apply it. And that's, I think, a task for everybody, everybody in this room and all of Andy's readers and uh, uh, everybody in the city. Um, I'd like to thank all of those of you who've come today to the box, in fact, all those who've contributed to the debate, shared their thoughts. Um, gun crime isn't going to gonna go away anytime soon, but with the efforts of agencies like Merseyside Police and the public sector and our teachers and our parents, um, we have a chance of perhaps putting it back in its place and allowing our young people to get on with their lives in safety and security. Thank you very much for joining us today at FACT, and thank you, Tenant Smith.